Well, today we are so excited to welcome back our great friend, Byron Emmert from uh, Minneapolis area, and he's been part of Eagle Brook Church for many years in many different leadership roles. And uh, Byron, you have just poured into our team immeasurably, you know, uh, for many years, and he's poured into our church family. He's been here and um, given different messages, but also you've you've really helped our team of leaders uh, become better leaders, and that's been incredible. And you serve with such a humbleness, and so you're going to hear that today through his message, and you love people, you love Jesus, I've heard you love pizza. <laughs> uh, and then Byron, I did go behind your back, and I texted your wife, and I just asked her a couple questions. Oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> so that maybe I could share. But she was so kind and so uh, genuine in her answer. I asked her a little bit, we're in a series, Better Together, and so I said, Linda, tell me when you hear better together, what does that mean to you in terms of your marriage uh, with you and, and Linda? And, um, and she just shared, she said, the love and the commitment that you have made to each other through the years has made you better. And also, each of you, your commitment to Jesus over the years has really just made you better together. And so we are so excited for your influence in all of our lives. Can't wait to hear your message. If you're watching online right now, blow up the chat with high fives here in person. <laughs> Let's give Byron a great Prairie Heights warm welcome. Thank you, Beth, and uh, hello, Prairie Heights. It's always great to be back. Uh, Beth, as you're interviewing my wife about something to say about me and we're better together and it takes commitment, without a doubt, in our early years, uh, let's say that I was pro trying to prove myself by trying to fix things around the house. Listen, I, I have no acumen for that. I am not a fixer, but you know, I, I thought I better prove myself to my sweetheart and finally, uh, this probably caused more tension and frustration in our marriage than anything else, that I would try and it would be worse. And so finally, one day, out of sheer commitment and love, she just said, honey, just so you know, you don't have to fix anything to prove your manhood. Just go speak somewhere, and then we'll hire somebody who actually knows what they're doing. <laughs> so that's how it works. 43 years. We're, we're just real thankful for, uh, for being together for 43 years. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, nowadays that is something worth applauding, isn't it? Without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, <clears throat> Beth mentioned to you that uh, things have been different and they're going to be different this fall. And we're in a series called Better Together. And last week Mike gave a great message on Engage. And today I'm going to talk about serving. And to get you thinking about that, I want to introduce to you our eight grandkids. And you'll see the shot up here. Uh, this is Linda and me hugging our kids eight grandkids for the first time after weeks of COVID quarantine. I mean, there was nothing sweeter. We were laughing. We were crying. It was just craziness. Now, come to this last weekend, there was more craziness. Now, here's the next shot. This is last week yesterday uh, for our fifth annual Cousin Camp Chaos. That's what CCC stands for. And my wife has a shirt on that says Chaos Coordinator. Uh, and we run like a camp. We, we take all eight grandkids right now. They're between the ages of 5 and 14. We take them for three days. We give our adult married kids a break from their kids. And we run this thing like a camp. I mean, uh, Linda's the director. I'm the assistant director, although I am the camp speaker. And uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we have all these activities. I mean, we have a schedule. We have chants. We have cheers. We have rules. We go to parks. We have crafts, we play football, we have slip and slide, we go to a pool, we go to the lake, and it goes on and on and on, and Linda goes crazy trying to feed these eight hungry little monsters for three days. And so when, they're, when it's over and our adult kids have picked them up and the last of them go out, we clean up a few basic things so that we can get to one location, and that's horizontal on the couch. And it's sort of like uh, <coughs> Linda and I said, help, we've fallen, and we probably won't ever get up. People have asked, so what do your adult kids do during those three days? And I say, 
They praised God for their grandchildren, for their kids having the greatest grandparents on the face of the earth. You know, if you want to be great, <clears throat> try doing camp with your grandkids. Your kids will really appreciate it. Now, some of you are just kids yourself, and so, <clears throat> you know, maybe someday. But when you think about being great, Jesus had a lot to say about being great, about leadership. And I want to take you there right now as we dive into the whole idea of service. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 28, Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it's going to be different. Whoever wants to be a leader, and in some other of the Gospels, it says, who wants to be great among you, you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your, are you ready for this? Your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. The ultimate serving sacrifice, Jesus humbled himself and died death through crucifixion on the cross for our sins. But he rose again to prove that he's the Savior. And that's why we can celebrate no matter what's going on in the world. We have more than hope. We have guarantee of how this whole thing is going to end because someday, if we're a Christ follower, we get to go to heaven. So let me just comment there. Uh, because I know Prairie Heights connects with many different kinds of people, and some of you are perhaps new to the whole faith idea, or you're checking it out, or you're watching online right now, and you're wondering about God and Jesus and spiritual things, and what do all these people think about what we're doing here and all this? <laughs> Hang in there, because today, this is something that all of us can be about, and that's serving, without a doubt, serving. And Jesus is our example. In fact, when you read this passage about being great, some of us might go, okay, no, so we're supposed to be a servant, so what do we do? What am I supposed to do? But I want to challenge us to think about the real question to begin with anyway is not what should we do, but who should we be? Initially, God is more concerned about who we are than what we do for him. And he wants us to know his son, Jesus, as our savior. And he wants us to become like Jesus, to be Christ-like, to conform to his image. And that's where servanthood begins, for us to be like Jesus. That's what serving is about. It starts there. It's like the mom with two little kids, two little brothers, and they are arguing over two cookies that are on a plate. And one is bigger than the other. And they're arguing about who's going to get the biggest and who's going to get the smallest. And the mom says, boys, boys, think about it. What would Jesus do? So the older brother looks at his little brother and goes, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> you got to think about that a little bit, don't you? See, we, in our own natural humanity, we like being served, having the best, rather than giving selflessly or sacrificially or serving others. So if we are going to be better together... If we're going to really get a handle on what it means to serve others, we need to be like Jesus. So we're going to answer this question. How can we be better together in serving Jesus? We need to be like him in several ways. And better together as a church begins with each of us making a commitment individually to be more like Christ when it comes to serving. Here's the first way we need to be like Jesus. We need... Hearts that overflow with compassion. Hearts that overflow with compassion. I bet you would agree with me. Our world could use a little more compassion right now. And I'm going to tell you, this is something I, I'm, I'm going to be real transparent with. In the last few months with the COVID thing and then with the cancel culture and the rioting and the racial divide and everything going on in the world... There are so many moments when I see someone or I see a group or I hear someone make a comment or I read a post on Facebook and I feel this, sometimes it's just frustration and sometimes though it, it boils up into anger. And I'll be the first to admit, I don't have a whole lot of Christ-like compassion that's overflowing out of my heart for some people. 
How about you? And maybe it's not just what's going on in the world around us. Maybe it's someone you know personally. Like, for example, think about it right now. Who annoys you right now? Now, some of you have a long list. <laughs> might be a family member. Might be a neighbor. Who frustrates you? Who makes your emotions sort of boil up at times? Do you have compassion for them? Hey, because we're all born sinful in this world. Do we have compassion for those around us? Jesus did. Look at chapter 9 in Matthew. Jesus was traveling through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. If our world would see Jesus as shepherd right now, it'd be transformed. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers in his fields. And if you are a Christ follower this morning, God is calling you and me to be workers, to make a difference, to reach people for him, that they might experience Jesus and his love, his forgiveness, and the hope of eternal life that we are going to receive someday when this world is done. Compassion. Let me tell you about a church that I visited several years ago. A friend of mine and I were going to speak at a, at a youth conference there for a couple of days, and it was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And uh, we arrived on a Saturday night, and a Sunday morning we took in the service, and the best way I can describe it is that it was mind-blowing. There were a couple thousand people in this vast auditorium, but here's what I saw. I saw rich people, people who looked so poor, I was wondering if they were homeless. Every race you can imagine, but it was a taste of heaven because they are standing there side by side and worshiping Jesus. It was like every tribe, tongue, and nation that Revelation tells us about. That's what's going to be in heaven someday. It was a little bit of heaven on earth right now. My friend turned to me and he says, you know what, Byron? I said, what? I think Jesus spends a lot of time here. I said, without a doubt. So we got to meet the pastor afterwards, and we asked him about the story of this church. And he said they had been a church of a few hundred people, and, you know, they talked about serving and serving each other. And, you know, like a lot of churches, people viewed serving primarily as being on a committee or doing this or, or doing that. And he said, but then we got serious because we saw in the scriptures about the compassion of Jesus Christ. And we said, if we're going to be better together, we've got to start serving those even outside the this building that we call our church home. So we started to feed the hungry. We started to reach out those who didn't have much. And we opened up a hospice because of the AIDS disease that was spreading across America, and especially that part of Florida right then. And people were dying of AIDS. And so they opened up this hospice and took people in and they would nurse them and care for them and bind their wounds and share the love of Christ and then have the opportunity to share who Jesus really is. And in the course of a few years, several people before they passed away, they put their faith in Jesus. And then the pastor said, and then things took off. And now thousands of people call this church home. It reminds me of Prairie Heights. Some years ago, you were a few hundred people meeting in the Fargo Dome, and look what God is doing. And I know that the history of the leadership of this church has challenged you about service, about serving, serving one another, serving those in the world around us, but it takes the heart of compassion. Let me show you the second way that we need to be like Jesus. We need to have eyes that see others the way God sees them. We need eyes that see each other the way God sees each of us and those around us. You know, in our culture today, it's so easy to label people, isn't it? I mentioned social media before. 
you go on social media and you read a few posts and just instinctively we go, oh, I can label that person as a, or someone you meet or a neighbor or even a family member. They say something or don't say something or they do something or don't do something and we label them. God sees every single one that he's created, created in his image as fearfully, wonderfully made. Look what David says in Psalm 139. He says this, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Jesus modeled this for us in his ministry during those 33 years on earth. The way he saw people. You remember the story? If you've gone to church, you've heard the story about the little boy with the loaves and fishes that Jesus took that and he multiplied it and fed thousands of people. He was just a little boy, probably unnoticed. Probably a lot of people would go, huh, he's just a kid, doesn't have much potential. But Jesus saw him differently. What about Zacchaeus, the tax collector? Everybody hated Jesus saw him differently. Jesus knew that he could change this Zacchaeus who had been created fearfully and wonderfully into one of his followers and become a very giving person. The woman caught in adultery. Bad reputation. Caught in the act. Trouble. But Jesus saw her as fearfully and wonderfully made who needed forgiveness and direction in life. Or how about the lepers that you read about in the New Testament and how they were ostracized? Jesus did not practice social distancing with lepers. He touched them and healed them. They belonged to him as his followers. How do you and I see people who are different or people who don't measure up to what we think or have expectations about. Do we see them our way or do we see them God's way as fearfully and wonderfully made? My cousin and his wife years ago had one little girl and they wanted a, another little child and they didn't get pregnant so they went to India and adopted this beautiful little boy. They named him Elijah, brought him home. And then sure enough, the next year, they had one of their own, a boy named him Levi. Levi was total Scandinavian, blonde hair, fair-skinned. Elijah, just this beautiful, rich, dark-toned skin and black hair. And by the time they were about two, two and a half, even though Elijah was a year older, they were the same size physically. And Annie, who is now five, she's watching her mom help these two little guys get dressed and her mom goes, they're wearing the same clothes. And Annie goes, I know, Mom. If this keeps up, how are we going to tell them apart? <laughs> how different the world would be if we saw each other the way God sees us. Here's the next way that we need to be like Jesus. We need ears that listen to their story. Ears that listen to their story. So much... Much of the time in conversation, we're not really listening to others. We're thinking about what we're going to say next, right? We love it, perhaps, when people start asking us questions, and all of a sudden we find ourselves, wow, I've been talking a long time. People love to be noticed. People deep down inside wish somebody would acknowledge them and be willing to learn their story. Do we have ears that listen that way? In Psalm 69 in the Old Testament, for the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. God wants to free us. Let me tell you about a man that I met some years ago in Washington, D.C. It was one of the most convicting experiences in my life. I was co-leading this big event called DCLA that Youth for Christ used to do every three years. And we had thousands and thousands of students and leaders coming to Washington, D.C. for a five-day conference. Well, the day was supposed to start, and people are coming and registering and all of that. I realized that uh, a couple of people on my team had forgotten to go get cash that we were going to need. And I said, I'll do it. So that 
on a noon hour, uh, I ran uh, to the bank there in downtown D.C., and the one that we were using, and it was closed. Lunch hour, closed. Can you believe it? So they had these mazes set up, you know, like Disneyland, Disney World, you know, where you keep doing this and you keep seeing the same people over and over again. And I, here's, I'll be honest, here's what I was thinking. Come on, God, open that bank. There's thousands of people coming tonight, and uh, you know I'm a pretty important person today. I've got a lot to do. I've got a lot of responsibility. Open the bank. And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed this gentleman, and at first glance, I thought, boy, he looks homeless. And so I, I, I glanced away because I was pretty self-absorbed in that minute. And then I, I heard God's Spirit saying, Byron, right now the most important thing in the world is not the thousands of kids and leaders coming tonight. The most important thing in the world is that you reach out to this man, one of my creation, and learn his story. So I looked back at him, and he gave me this huge smile <laughs> with two teeth. That was it. So I ducked under the rope, and I got in line with him, and I started to learn his story. And I said, hi, I'm Byron. And he put his hand out, and he said, I'm Darby. I said, Darby, tell me about yourself. Here's what I found out about Darby. Grew up in the inner city of D.C. No family. And he was at the bank that day, not to get cash, but to bring money to the bank because the IRS had screwed up years earlier and had kept overpaying him refunds. And they had overpaid him to the tune of $11,000 and now they were asking him. And he had been homeless for a few years and now he's living in a housing development project. He's washing dishes at a restaurant. And I listened and tears are in his eyes and tears are my eyes and I looked at him. I said, Darby, I'm so sorry. And without teeth, he looked at me, and I'll never forget this. And he goes, Isn't that a hell of a way to treat an old man? I said, Yeah. So we're still waiting for the bank to open up. He looks at me and he says, I wish you would live closer. I said, Well, I live in Minnesota. I don't, you know. I said, We hardly know each other. Why, why would you want me to live closer? And he said, could I trust you? I said, you trust me, Darby. We just met. Why do you trust me? This is the most time anyone has talked to me or listened to me in years. I said, God, forgive me for thinking that I was too important to spend time with this person who needs someone to love him, who most of all needs to know the love of Jesus. So I had a chance to share the good news and how Darby could know Christ as Savior and go to heaven someday, and I left him a little booklet. And for many years since, I often think about him, and I'm going to guess because of his age, he has passed away by now. But one of the things I look forward to when I get to heaven, I just believe that I'm going to see him in heaven. Not because of me, but because of God wanting us to have hearts full of compassion. To have eyes that see others the way he does. To have ears that listen to their story. And that have hands that show selfless love. That's the fourth way. We need to become more and more like Christ. We need hands that show selfless love. Look what's happening as Jesus is mentoring and developing his disciples, he's getting them ready pre-crucifixion and resurrection because he's preparing them to lead by serving and to start the early church. And so to teach them about serving, he's, after supper, he has everyone put their feet out and he's washing feet. Look at this. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and he sat down and he asked, do you understand what I was doing? I, your Lord, your teacher, have washed your feet. You ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example. Do as I have done unto you. Right now, some of you are going, oh, boy, don't tell me this guest speaker is going to make us take our socks and shoes off and we're going to wash feet. 
No. But I want us to see the humility of Jesus, the willingness to let our hands be selfless and show his love. As we see from Sanctuary Covenant Church in Minneapolis just recently, I want you to watch this. A North Minneapolis church is sharing the love with the community through peace, prayer, and food. Our Mary Mose joins us live now from the Sanctuary Covenant Church. Good afternoon, Mary Hey, Heather, good afternoon. So this started as just a beautiful accident. When George Floyd first died, the Covenant Church here decided to put on a barbecue on their front lawn just to invite community members to be together in this dark time and eat lunch. Well, it accidentally turned into a massive food drive. Take a look at this. This is what it's turned into in just a few days. This line in front of me is all the people in the North Minneapolis community in need of free supplies right now. And each tent has different items from toiletries, diapers, feminine hygiene products, and of course, grocery bags of food. I spoke with the lead pastor of this church who said he can't believe how much impact they've had in just a few days. Since last Wednesday, we've served a couple thousand people, hot dogs, hamburgers, water. We've handed out thousands and thousands of groceries to the community. And we see people not only coming to get items, but hanging around, um, encouraging one another, having a good time. In a little bit, there'll be some music on um, just to celebrate the community. And that's, that's the heart of our church. I think that's the spirit of North Minneapolis, that in hard times, we move towards one another as opposed to pulling away from one another. We move toward one another through service. In an interview, this pastor also said this, look, we've got a lot of people from the suburbs who want to come and help, but can I challenge everybody? Don't come down here and hand out food or do something like that so that you feel better about what's going on. Come down and serve so that people experience the love of Jesus. It's different. Okay, hearts that overflow with compassion, eyes that see others the way God does, ears that listen to their story, hands that show selfless love, and here's the last way I'm going to challenge us here this morning about serving better together. We need mouths and feet that bring the good news to others. It's all about serving. Mouths and feet that bring the good news to others. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to be in a country, in fact, I've been there several times, Bangladesh, which is always one of the poorest nations in the entire world, 99% Muslim. In fact, one time when I was there, the, the Taliban had just overthrown the government and were now in control. And so our Youth for Christ program there couldn't even go by the name Youth for Christ. It was Youth First Concerns, Because fear of persecution, fear of death. Well, I'm there, and there's 1,200 kids attending. Many of them have spent hours, some of them as far as 20 to 22-hour ride on the top of a bus or the back of an old truck with animals and trying to get to this camp in Bangladesh for a conference. Hundreds of Christ-following teenagers were there, and they had been praying and working and planning and inviting their Muslim friends. So it's on the third night. I'm speaking, 1,200. It's about 104 degrees out and 80% humidity. It's brutal inside. And I mean, but God was at work. But once again, I have to be honest. I have to tell you, I was thinking about myself short on faith. Well, here's what happened. It was the third night, and I was planning to give these kids an opportunity to put their trust in Christ as Savior the second night, or the following night. And so as I'm winding up my talk, I sense Jesus tell me, Byron, I want you to give them the opportunity to receive me as their Savior tonight. And I'm kind of arguing with the Lord. I'm going, really? I don't know. It's this is not a good night. I was going to do that tomorrow. I know, but I want you to do this tonight, Byron. I said, oh, I'm going, and you know, I'm talking, and I'm thinking this at the same time. And I'm going, Lord, I don't know. It's, it's really hot, really humid. Who wants to accept Jesus, you know, when it's hot and humid out? As I'm drenched with sweat. But I did. So I said, I've been telling you about Jesus, that he died and that he rose again. And no matter what this life is like, 
He'll walk you through, see you through this life, and someday take you to heaven. And right now, I'm going to say, any of you out here, if you want to place your faith in Christ and you want to receive him as Savior, I want you to stand up right now. And my translator is talking. Immediately, over 100 kids, stand up. I should have been going, wow, God, this is amazing. No. No. I turned to my translator and I said, uh, something's wrong. Goes, what? There's too many. They must not have understood me. He goes, oh, they understood you. Oh, no, I don't know. He said, well, then tell them again. We're having this conversation. So I said, okay. And then I made it even harder. I repeated everything I just said and I said, and you know you live in a country where if you follow Christ... You will be persecuted if they find out. You could even lose your life. But if you're willing to go public and say, I'm going to follow Jesus, I want you to stand up right now. And now another 150 kids stand up. And now I'm a bowl of weeping jello on the stage. I cue the band. They start playing. I invite these students and the Youth for Christ staff to come up toward the front, and we begin this follow-up, this counseling, this prayer time. And there were so many students receiving Christ that staff were counseling six to ten kids in groups. And I go and I stand in the middle of this, and I ask Jesus to forgive me for being short on faith as I'm standing there taking this all in, and now I'm praising God. All of a sudden, I felt something on the top of my feet. I, I kind of jumped back thinking it was one of those little critters that I'd seen so many of. But no, it was this beautiful young Bengali girl about age 20 kissing my feet. Wouldn't you jump back if somebody's kissing your feet? I jump back, I go, what are you doing? And I helped her up, and as I'm helping her up, she goes, I'm kissing your feet. I said, I know, but why are you kissing my feet? She said, your feet are blessed. I said, oh, no, no, I have bad feet. (laughs) And she says, For the last two years, other Christian students and myself, we have been praying that God would send a holy man to this conference to tell people, I don't know, Jesus, and you're the holy man. I went, oh, no, no, I'm not holy. Just ask my wife. She'll she'll confirm that. And then she schooled me. Mr. Byron, remember what we find in Isaiah and repeat it again in Romans. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? And that is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. She said, you have beautiful feet because you brought the good news. I went, Sakina. I would learned her name. I said, you're the one. You and your friends are the one. The staff, you're the ones. You've been planning. You've been praying It's not about me coming from America and just speaking. Yes, I know that God used that. But thank you for serving, being committed to your country, hearing the good news. She nodded and smiled, and then she said, this is, and I don't remember her friend's name. And she pointed to another young lady, and she said, this is my friend. She came here Muslim. But 10 minutes ago, she became a follower of Jesus. And she would like to, um, um, and I went, really? So now this girl kneels down and kisses my feet. Life-changing for me. Now, please understand, it's not that every single one of you here are listening or watching online. Is supposed to be a speaker. It's about each of us being willing to have a mouth and feet that will serve and do anything we can so that people might know Jesus. And I know the heart of this church. I know that this church is not only about growing you in your faith, but about reaching out and seeing God change lives both now and forever. Who does Jesus want us to be? A servant like him. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you 
that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for us. Father, I pray that in this moment, your Holy Spirit would just really have our attention about having a heart that's willing to be like you and to serve others. In Jesus' name.